Through going this tutorial, we will learn how the Godot editor works, how to structure a project, and build a 2D game. The game is called Dodge the Creeps. Your character must move and avoid the enemies for as long as possible. We will learn to create a complete 2D game, structure a simple project, move the player character and change its sprite, spawn random enemies, and change the score, and count the score. I guess we'll also have to change the score. There's another one in 3D, but we recommend that you start with the 2D one. You can find a completed version there. Skip that. I've gone, I have now gone through the getting started. So a confession, I tried this 2D tutorial a while ago and I was getting pretty lost in the user interface of Godot. But now that I've done the more basic stuff, I think this is gonna work a little better. So contents, setting it starts with setting up the project. Next, setting up the project in the in this short first part, we'll set up and organize the project. Launch Godot and create a new project. You know what? I think I want to go full screen with these. Except that's not gonna work very well. Uh, that's okay. New project. Users, Eric Anderson, workspace, Godot, projects, create folder. I'm gonna call this Dodge the Creeps. Create folder, Dodge the Creeps, create and edit. Okay, let's go. New project. I kind of jumped ahead of the instructions. And then I need to move the assets into place. I'll do that now. Art. And fonts. Game is designed for portrait mode, so we need to adjust the size of the game window. Click on Project, Project Settings to open the Project Settings window. And the left column open Display window. They're set width to 480 and height to 720. Project Settings window 480 by 720. And we also there's something else that it needs me to do. Also scroll down to the bottom of the section and under stretch options set mode to 2D and aspect to keep. Aspect keep. Okay. Progressing the project. In this project, we will make make three independent scenes: player, mob, and HUD, which we will combine into the game's main scene. In a larger project, it might be useful to create folders to hold the various scenes and their scripts, but for this relatively small game, you can save scenes and scripts in the project root folder identified by RES, which I've learned stands for resources. You can see your project folders in the file system doc in the lower left corner. Let's double check on that and close the settings. Here's RES with art, fonts, default env.tres, don't know what that is, but okay, and icon.png. With the project in place, we're ready to design the player scene in the next lesson. Creating the player scene. With the project's settings in place, we can start working on the player controlled character. 
The first scene will define the player object. One of the benefits of creating a separate player scene is that we can test it separately, even before we've created other parts of the game. Node structure. To begin, we need to create, choose a root node for the player object. As a general rule, a scene's root node should reflect the object's desired functionality. What the object is. Click the other node button and add an area 2D node to the scene. The other node area 2D. Create. Godot will display a warning icon next to the node in the scene tree. You can ignore it for now. We will address it later. With area 2D, we can detect objects that overlap or run into the player. Change the node's name to player by double-clicking on it. Now that we've set the scene's root node, we can add additional nodes to give it more functionality. Before we add any children to the player node, we want to make sure we don't accidentally move or resize them by clicking on them. Select the node and click the icon to the right of the lock. Its tooltip says, make sure object's children are not selectable. So select player, group selected nodes, command J, make sure the object's children are not selectable. Got it. Save the scene. Player.tscn, save. Note, for this project, we will be following the following name, following the node naming conventions. GDScript classes, nodes, use Pascal case, variables and functions use snake case, and constants use all caps. Uh, C sharp, I'm not using. Sprite animation. Click on the player node and add an animated sprite node as a child. Add a node, animated sprite. Create. An animated, the animated sprite will handle the appearance and animations for our player. Notice that there is a warning symbol next to the node. Yes, there is. An animated sprite requires a sprite frames resource, which is a list of the animations it can display. To create one, oh hello Sammy! Are you going to rub on the microphone? Do you want some attention? There he goes. Oh, careful Sammy, don't knock over my timer. Okay. An animated sprite requires sprite frames resource, which is a list of animations can just play. To create one, find the frames property in the inspector and click empty arrow new sprite frames. Click again to open the sprite frames panel. So in the inspector, frames, empty, new sprite frames. Click again to open the sprite frames editor. Cool. On the left is a list of animations. Click the default one and rename it to walk. Default animation renamed to walk. Then click the new animation button to create a second animation named up. New animation. Find the player images in the file system tab. They're in the art folder you unzipped earlier. Drag the two images for each animation, named player gray up one slash two and player gray walk one slash two, into the animation frames side of the panel for the corresponding animation. So we have art player gray walk one and two. And we have player gray up one and two. Cool. The player images are a bit too large for the game window, so we need to scale them down. Click on the animated sprite node and select and set the scale property to 0.5 comma 0.5. You can find it in the inspector under the 2D node heading. Scale to 0.5.5. .5. Animated sprite, 
2D node transform scale 0.5 comma 0.5. Let's zoom in so we can see this thing. That looks like a good size relative to the playing area. Finally, add a collision shape 2D as a child of player. Add a collision shape. Two D. Oh, you can just hit enter and it goes. That's convenient. This will determine the player's hitbox or the bounds of the collision area. For this character, a capsule shape two D node gives the best fit. So next to its shape, next so next to shape in the inspector, click empty arrow new capsule shape two D. Using the two size handles, reshape, resize the shape to cover the sprite. Okay, collision shape new capsule shape 2d grab these nodes whoa that looks about right when you're finished your player scene should look like this player animated sprite collision shape 2d make sure to save the scene after these changes save the scene Cool. In the next part, we'll add a script to the player node to move and animate it. Then we'll set up collision detection to know when the player got hit by something. Coding the player. In this lesson, we'll add the movement, animation, we'll add player movement, animation, and set it up to detect collisions. To do so, we need to add some functionality that we can't get from a built-in node, so we'll add a script. Click the player node and click attach script button. In the script settings window, you can leave the default settings alone, just click create. Attach a new script, default settings, create. Okay, and here's our script. Note, if you're creating a C-sharp script or other languages, select the language from the language drop-down menu before hitting create. We're using Godot script. Note, if this is your first time encountering GD script, please read scripting languages before continuing. I have read that. Start by declaring the memory variables this object will need. We have extends area 2D, then export var speed equal 400. And export means that it'll be available. Actually, I think we can see it now. Yeah, it's right there, speed 400, and we can change it, or we can reset it to the variable, the value set in the script. Var screen size. Using the export keyword on the first variable, speed allows us to set its value in the inspector. This can be handy for values that you want to be able to adjust, like a node's built-in properties. Click on the player node and you'll see the property now appears in the script variable section of the inspector. Like, yeah, just like I showed. Remember, if you change the value here, it will override the value written in the script. Warning if you're using C-sharp, nope. The underscore ready function is called when a node enters the scene tree, which is a good time to find the size of the game window. Funk ready screen size equals get viewport rect dot size. Screen size equals Viewport. Was that what that was? Get viewport rect. Get viewport rect. Parens. Dot size. Let's hide that for now. Now we can use the process function to define what the player will do. Process is called every frame, so we'll use it to update elements of our game, which we expect will change often. For our player, we need to do the following. Check for input, move in the given direction, play the appropriate animation. First, we need to check for input. Is the player pressing a key? For this game, we have four direction inputs to check. Input actions are defined in project settings under input map. 
Here you can define custom events and assign different keys, mouse events, or other inputs to them. For this game, we will map the arrow keys to the four directions. Click on Project, Project Settings to open the Project Settings window and click on the Input Map tab on the top. Type Move Right in the top bar and click Add button to add the Move Right action. Okay, Project, Project Settings, Input Map. Type move right in the top bar and click add button to add the move right action. And tap, click the add button to add the move right action. Add. We need to assign a key to this action. Click the plus icon to the right, then click key option in the drag down menu. A dialog asks you to type in the divide key. Press the right arrow on your keyboard and click OK. Move right, here it is. Plus, physical key, press the key, right, physical, OK. This is different. The one I did before, probably because I'm on the version 3.5 documentation instead of the 3.2 documentation. Repeat these steps and add three more mappings. Move left, move up, and move down. Your input tab should look like this. Right, move left, move up, move down. I was supposed to push key instead of physical key. I don't know how much that matters, but let's do it right. Okay, move up. Add key up. Okay. Down, add, key, down, oops, key, down, okay, close, got that. You can detect whether a key is pressed using input.isAction pressed. Which, returns, which returns true if it's pressed or false if it isn't. So func process, oh, there's a whole bunch of code here, but I'm gonna take the time and type it out. Func process of delta. Bar velocity equals vector two dot zero. If input dot is action pressed, move right. Move right. Colon. Velocity dot x plus equals one. Then we're getting something similar. If input dot is action pressed. Move. Guessing they did left next. Velocity dot x minus equals one. If input dot is action impd dot is then pressed. Move down. E dot y. Now I want to check. Move down is plus equal 1 for velocity dot y. If input that is action pressed, 
uh, move down velocity dot y minus equals one. Is that right? Move up minus equals one. If velocity dot length is greater than zero, this is looking familiar now for me. If velocity dot length is greater than zero, velocity equals velocity dot normalized times speed. Animated sprite dot play. Else animated sprite dot stop. So summarizing this, I'll try to summarize it myself and then we'll look at the look at that. Start by setting velocity to zero vector, then check for right, left, up and down, and accordingly adjust the X and y values on velocity. Then normalize the velocity and multiply it by speed and play the animated sprite. We start by setting the velocity to zero, zero. By default, the player should not be moving. Then we check each input and add subtract from the velocity to take in a total direction. For example, if you hold right and down at the same time, the resulting velocity vector will be one, one. In this case, since we're adding a horizontal and vertical component, the player will move faster diagonally than if it just moved horizontally. We can prevent that if we normalize the velocity, which means set it length to 1, then multiply by the desired speed. This means no more fast diagonal movement. If you've never used vector math or explanation more, you can see a you can see an explanation of vector usage in Godot at vector math. It's good to know, but won't be necessary for the rest of the tutorial. We'll open that in a new tab for later. We can also check whether the player is moving, so you can call play or stop on the animated sprite. Tip. Dollar sign is shorthand for get node, so in the code above, animated sprite dot play is the same as get node animated sprite dot play. In GD script, dollar sign returns the node at the relative path from the current node, or returns null if the node isn't found. That's useful. I think that's useful. Since animated sprite is a child of the current node, we can use animated sprite. Now that we have a movement direction, we can update the player's position. We can also use clamp to prevent it from leaving the screen. Clamping a value means restricting it to the given range. Add the following to the bottom of the process function, make sure it's not indented under the else. Position plus equals velocity times delta. On indent, position equals velocity times delta. Position.x equal clamp position.x zero screen size.x. Um, what was it? Position.x zero screen size.x. Undersource side dot x, then position dot y equals clamp position dot y comma zero comma screen size dot y, and Sammy is back again. Oh, he stepped on a keyboard. Sammy, move your toe. Go say hello to the camera. Let's get him in the camera just a little bit more. Give him some scratches. Say hello to Twitch, Sammy. I know you can't see him very well, probably, but he's here. What are you doing, Sammy? Oh, he's trying to get get at some things I don't want him getting at. 
Sorry if that bumped the mic, folks. Let's get back into it. Screen size. There is no screen size. How's everyone doing tonight? Thanks for stopping by and watching. If the delta parameter in the process function refers to the frame length, the amount of time that the previous frame took to complete. Using this value ensures that your move will remain consistent even if the frame rate changes. Click play scene. F6, Command R, and confirm you can move the player around the screen in all directions. Is this gonna... Okay, let's click Play Scene, Command R. Invalid get index length on base fidget dot length paren? Maybe I did. dot length parens. Okay, length is a function. Run the screen again. Normalize must also be a function. Command run the scene. Oh, it's almost working. Clamp. Clamps the value. Clamps value and returns a value not less than min and not more than max. Clamp 1,000 from 1 to 20, clamp minus 10 from 1 to 20, clamp 15 from 1 to 20. Okay. This looks fine. Oh, position equals velocity times delta. That's got to be a plus equals. Okay. and the horizontal motion is working in the correct way. That's good. We can close that down. Go back to the tutorial. We start by setting the velocity to zero, zero. Okay, I read that. Now that we have a movement direction, we can update the player's position. We can also use clamp. Add the following to the bottom of the process function. Make sure it's not indented under the else. Okay. Play scene. Choosing animations. Now that the player can move, we need to change which animate which animation the animated sprite is playing based on its direction. We can we have the walk animation which shows the player walking to the right. This animation should be flipped horizontally using the flip H property from left movement. We also have the up animation which should be flipped vertically with flip V for downward movement. Let's place this code at the end of the process function. So we start with if velocity.x not equals zero. So as long as there's some x velocity, it's going to be in the walking mode. Animated sprite that animation equal walk. Animated sprite dot flip v equal false. Flip v underscore v equal false. But if animated, but animated sprite dot velocity dot flip h equals velocity dot x less than zero.
animated sprite dot flip h equals condition velocity dot x less than zero. Elif velocity dot y not equal zero. What did I do wrong here? Animated sprite. Oh, I didn't do anything wrong here, apparently. We have animated sprite dot animation equal up. Quote up. It will quote walk. And animated sprite dot flip b equals velocity dot y greater than zero. Why did we have to set flip b equals false? Oh, because it may have been true from before. Okay, let's run the scene. Okay, that works. Assignments in the code above are a common shorthand for programmers. It's a shorthand for this. Yep. Play the scene and again and check that the animations are correct in each of the directions. So let's actually double check that. Oops. Walking up looks good. Walking down looks good. Walking right looks good. Walking left looks good. What about diagonal left? So whenever there's a diagonal, it's going to be... It's going to be like the walk mode. Which is a little awkward when you're transitioning like this. Or, or like, um... This is an awkward transition. See how that looks awkward? Oops, it's not easy to do. <laughs> so if it's going down, but then I start to also go right, it looks kind of weird. But it looks okay. When you're sure the movement is working correctly, add this line to ready so the player will be hidden when the game starts. Add hide to ready. Punk ready. Hide. Preparing for collisions. We want player to detect when it's hit by an enemy, but we haven't made any enemies yet. That's okay because we're going to use Godot's signal functionality to make it work. Add the following at the top of the script after extends 2D. Signal hit. This defines a custom signal called hit that we will have our player emit and send out when it collides with an enemy. We will use area 2D to detect the collision. Select the player node and click the node tab next to the inspector tab to see the list of signals the player can emit. Select the player node and we can we have the signal hit that we can emit. Cool. Body entered. Notice our custom hit signal is there as well. Since our enemies are going to be rigid two body nodes, we want the body entered body colon none signal. This signal will be emitted when a body contacts the player. Click connect and the connect the signal window appears. Click 
um, body, it's body entered, right? Body entered, body node. We don't need to change any of these settings, so click connect again. Gano will automatically create a function in your player's script. On player body entered of body pass function. Notice the green icon indicating that a signal is connected to this function. Add this code to the function. On player body entered of body hide emit signal hit collision shape 2d dot set deferred disable true. I'm not going to remember all of that, but hide and emit signal hit. Collision shape must be deferred as we can't change physics properties on a physics callback. Sure. Dollar sign collision shape 2d dot set deferred disabled true. Disabled. True. Okay. Each time an enemy hits the player, the signal is going to be emitted. We need to disable the player's collision so we don't trigger the hit signal more than once. Note. Disabling the area's collision shape can cause an error if it happens in the middle of the engine's collision processing. Using set to first tells Godot to wait to disable the shape until it's safe to do so. The last piece is to add a function we can call to reset the player when starting a new game. Funk start of position. We'll put it at the bottom, I guess. Was it position? Oh, it was just POS. Position equals POS. Show. Dollar sign collision shape that disabled equals false. Okay, with the player working, we'll work on the enemy in the next lesson. And look, that's the end of that timer. So let's go to break mode. Creating the enemy. Now it's time to make the enemies our players will have to dodge. This behave their behavior will not be very complex. Mobs will spawn randomly at the edges of the screen choose a random direction, and move in a straight line. We'll create a mob scene which we can then instance to create any number of independent mobs in the game. Click New Scene and add the following nodes. Rigid Body 2D, named Mob. Oops, um, this is gonna... Okay. Click Scene, New Scene. New scene. Other node. Rigid body 2D named mob. Animated Sprite, Collision Shape 2D, Visibility Notify 2D. Animated Sprite, Create, Collision Shape 2D, excuse me, Visibility Notifier 2D but not as a subchild. Okay. Don't forget to set the children so they can't be selected like you did with player scene. Mob 2D can't select me. In the rigid body 2D properties, set gravity scale to zero so the mob will not fall downward. Rigid body 2D properties, gravity scale zero. 
rigid body 2d scale inspector properties gravity scale zero in addition under collision object 2d section click the mask property and uncheck the first box this will ensure the mobs do not collide with each other mask uncheck the first box Set Collision Mask. Set up the animated sprite like you did for the player. This time we have three animations. Fly, Swim, and Walk. There are two images for each animation in the art folder. Adjust the speed frame per second to three for all animations. Fly, Swim, and Walk. Okay. Animated sprite. Frames, new sprite frames, sprite frames, fly, new, limb, new, looks like it's alphabet order. Okay, enemy flying, alt 1, enemy flying, alt 2, swim, enemy swimming 1, enemy swimming 2, walk. Enemy walking one, enemy walking two. Set the playing property in the inspector to on. Oh, and there's supposed to be three frames. Three frames per second. Three. What do I set to on? Set the playing property in the inspector to on. Animated sprite. Frame zero. Playing on. Hey, look at it go. I guess fly is the default animation. Cool. We'll select one of these animals animations randomly so the mobs will have some variety. Like the player images, these mob images need to be scaled down. Set the animated sprite scale property to 0 0.75, 0 0.75. Animated sprite, transform, scale, 0.75, and 0.75. Cool. As in the player scene, add a capsule shape 2D for the collision. To align the shape with the image, you'll need to set the rotation degrees property to 90 under transforming the inspector. Note to do transform rotation degrees 90. Capsule shape, and we can click and drag to kind of uh, hold on. Collision shape 2D, capsule shape. It's a little tricky. Collision shape 2D. Let's look at it. Animated sprite. How do I activate a different animation? That'll come in the code, I guess. Save the scene. Mob.tscn. Cool. Enemy script. Add a script to the mob like this. 3D script extends rigid body 2D. Now let's look at the rest of the script. Mob, add script. In ready, we play the animation and randomly choose one of the three animation types. Funk, ready, animated sprite.playing equals true. Dog sign animated sprite.playing equals true. It's a lowercase true in this language. Bar mob types, 
equal animated sprite dot frames dot get animation names bar mob types equals animated sprite dot get animation what was it dot frames animation names parentheses because it's a function animated sprite dot animation equal mob types rand integer modulo mob types dot size mob types rand integer modulo mob types dot size is that right yeah size is a function First, we get the list of animation names from the animated sprites frame properties, frames properties. This returns an array containing all three animation names, WAP, WALK, SWIM, FLY. We then need to pick a random number between 0 and 2 to select one of these names from the list. Array indices start at 0. RAND I modulo N selects a random integer between 1 and N minus 1. No, you must use randomize if you want your sequence of random numbers to be different every time you run the scene. We're going to use randomize in our main scene, so we won't need it here. The last piece is to make the mobs delete themselves when they leave the screen. Connect the screen exited signal of the visibility notifier 2D node and add this code, Q3. So we do the visibility notifier, we do the node, we do the screen exited, we connect it, and we do QUUE three parens and delete what was a comment. This completes the mob scene. With the player and the enemies ready, in the next part we'll bring them together in a new scene. We'll make the we'll make enemies spawn randomly around the game board and move forward, turning our project into a playable game. Cool, making progress. The main game scene. Now it's time to bring everything we did together into a playable game scene. Create a new scene and add a node named main. The reason we are using node instead of node 2D is because this node will be a container for handling game logic. It does not require 2D functionality itself. Click the instance button, create a new scene and add a node named main. Scene, new scene, node node. Name it main. Click the instance button represented by a chain link icon and select your saved player dot tscn. Uh, player dot tscn. Open. Cool. Now add the following nodes as children of main and name them as shown, values are in seconds. Timer, named mob timer, to control how often mobs spawn. Timer, named mob timer. Create mob timer. Timer, named score timer. Make a timer, enter. Name it score timer but make it a parent of main. Timer named start timer. Oh wait, I mixed this up. I goofed. I made them children of player, but I want them to be children of main. Position 2D named start position to indicate the player's start position. Start position. Set the wait time property of each timer of, the, of each of the timer nodes as follows: mob timer 0.5 signals wait time 0.5. That's all in seconds. 
Score timer one. It's already there. Start timer two. In addition, set the one shot property of start timer to on. Start timer one shot on. And set the position of the start position node to 24450. Transform position 240 by select 450. Spawning mobs. The main node will be spawning new mobs and we want them to appear at a random location on the edge of the screen. Add a path new 2D node named mob path as a child of main. Main child path 2D. When you select path 2D you will see some new buttons at the top of the editor. Select the middle one, add point, and draw the path by clicking to add the points at the corners shown. To have the points snap to the grid, make sure use snap grid and use snap are both selected. These options can be found to the left of the lock button, appearing as a magnet next to some dots and intersecting lines respectively. Start to the Enable that, enable that. Where's the, um, it's kind of hard to see the outline of the game, but I think I see it. Yeah, it's there. Um, create path, snap, bring it down here. Whoa, and it already filled in the rest of it. Draw the path in clockwise order, or your mods will spawn outwards instead of inwards. Three, four, five. So I guess I do need to click it here still. Close. Neat. Oops, undo that. What is happening? <laughs> Clicking more is not going to help more. Alright, we're just going to cut this and start over. Path 2D. Create. Add point. One. I'm going to start again. Path 2D, create, right here, right over here, right down here, and I'm happy with that shape. So, close curve. Oh, nope, not yet. Path 2D, cut again, add path 2D, click, 1, 2, 3, 4, close, close curve, 5, is that it? I think that's set. Now that the path is defined, add a path follow 2D node as a child of mob path and name it mob spot location. Add child node path follow 2D and name it mob spawn location. This is mob path and this is mob spawn location. location. 
your scene should look like this. Player, mob timer, score timer, start timer, start position. Player, start timer, mob timer, score timer, start position. Mob path, mob spawn location. That all looks good. Main script. How we doing on the timer? Coming along. Add a script to main. Main. Uh, not a child, a script. Main.gd. At the top of the script, we use export packed scene to allow us to choose the mob scene we want to instance. Export packed scene bar mob scene. Export packed scene bar mob scene. Is that right? Oh, we need a snake case. Bar score. We also had a call to randomize here so that the random number generator generates different random numbers each time the game is run. Funk, ready, randomize. Ready, randomize. Click the main node and you will see the mob scene property in the inspector under script variables. Mob scene empty. Interesting. You can assign this property's value in two ways. Drag mob scene.tscn from the file system doc and drop it in the mob scene property. That sounds fun. Or click the down arrow next to empty and choose load select mob tscn. Actually, I'm going to do that way. Load mob.tscn open Next select the player node in the scene dock and access the node dock on the sidebar player access the node dock on the sidebar Make sure to have signals tab selected in the node dock Signals got it you should see a list of the signals for the player node. Find and double click the hit signal in the list or right click it and click connect. This will open the signal connection dialog. Signal connection dialog. We want to make a new function named game over which will handle what needs to happen when a game ends. Type game over in the receiver method box. Game over. At the bottom of the signal connection dialog and click connect. Funk game over pass. Add the following code to the new function as well as a new game function that will set up everything for a new game. Game over score timer dot stop. And mob timer dot stop. Meanwhile, funk new game score equals zero. It's just a variable. Score equals zero. Player dot start. Start position dot position. At start position dot position. And start timer dot start. Now connect the timeout signal of each of the timer nodes. Start timer score timer and mob timer to the main script. Start timer, timeout, on start timer, timeout. Score timer, Connect and mob timer. Timeout connect. On score timer timeout, score plus equals one. Wait, on start timer, 
um, on score timer timeout. That's this one up here. Oh, but it's not connected anymore if I do that. Okay, move this score down here. Put a pass on this one. On start timer timeout, my timer dot start. And score timer dot start. In on mob timer dot timeout, we will create a mob instance, pick a random starting location on the path 2D, and set the mob in motion. The path followed 2D node will automatically rotate as it follows the path, so we'll be used that to select the node's direction as well as its position. When we spawn a mob, we'll pick a random value between 150 and 250 for how fast each mob will move. It would be boring if they were all moving the same speed. Note that a new instance must be added to the scene using add child. So on mob timeout, that's this function. Var mob equal mob scene dot instance. Bar mob spawn location equals get node. Was it get node? Yeah, get node. Mob path slash mob spawn location. It's right there in the autocomplete. Mob path slash mob spawn location. Mob spawn location dot offset equals rand i. Mob spawn location dot offset equals rand i. We don't have to do a modulo on that. I guess it's circular, so it just goes around. I would think that you would need to do a modulo on that, but it, there's already a modulo because it's just going to go around it a million times and then where it lands is where it lands. Okay, that makes sense. Bar mobs, uh, what is it complaining about? Oh, mob spawn location already de already declared, so I can't declare it again. Bar direction equals mob spawn location dot rotation. Mob spawn location dot rotation. Plus pi over two. Looks good. Mob dot position equals mob spawn location dot position. Direction equals plus rand range minus pi over four to pi over four. Direction plus equals. Minus pi over four, comma, pi over four. Bob dot linear velocity equals velocity dot rotated direction. Equals velocity. Oh, we had var. I missed a line. Bar velocity equals vector. Oh, we're here. Mob dot rotation equals direction. And then bar velocity equals vector two. Rand range one fifty to two fifty zero. C 
zero point zero. Getting all floaty. Mob dot linear velocity. Equal velocity dot rotated of direction. Add child of mob. Y pi. Okay, important. Y pi. In functions requiring angles, Godot uses radians, not degrees. Pi represents a half turn in radians, about 3.1415. There is also tau, which is equal to 2 times pi. If you're more comfortable working with degrees, you'll need to use the degree to radian and radian to degree functions to convert between the two. Testing the scene. Let's test the scene to make sure everything is working. Add this new game call to ready. Ready, randomize, new game. I guess we can save it, finally. Let's also assign main as our main scene, the one that automatically runs when the game launches. Press the play button and select main.tscn when prompted. Select current. Let's see if this works. Hey, it's working! Ha ah, ha! Oh no! Me! Okay, let's let me lose. Oh! Score time. I need score timer. Uh, let's try to con can I try to continue? I don't know if it's gonna work. Oh, it, it broke. Because now it's never gonna start a new game. Okay. Gotta rerun. Just lose right away. Um the lose signal is not working. Let's see what the instructions say. You should be able to move the player around, see mob spawning, and see the player disappear when hit by a mob. When you're sure everything is working, remove the call to new game from underscore ready. And see the player disappear when hit by a mob. But it doesn't say anything about... Um, what am I trying to say? It doesn't say anything about restarting the game. They're probably going to build that into the next lesson. Remove the new game when you're sure everything is working. Remove the call to new game from ready. Okay. You should be able to move the player around, see mob spawning, and see the other player disappear when hit by a mob. Or see the player disappear when hit by a mob. Let's make sure that that all happens. We should see the mobs appearing sooner or later. There they go. Ooh. Uh-oh. Ah! Oh no, this is slightly hard. Okay, we can end the and it disappears, which I guess is all it needs to do. What's our game lacking? Some user interface. In the next session, we'll add a title screen and display our the player's score. Okay, next up is next. Heads up display. But that's the end of this timer. So it's time for a BRB screen. Back to scene, and we are on to heads up display. The final, the final piece our game needs is a user interface to display things like score, a game over message, and a restart button. Create a new scene and add a canvas layer node named HUD. Scene, new scene. Canvas layer, and it's going to be named HUD. HUD stands for Heads Up Display, an informational display that appears as an overlay on top of the game view. The 
canvas layer node lets us draw our UI elements as a, on a layer above the rest of the game so that the information displays isn't covered up by any game elements like the player or mobs. The HUD needs to display the following information. Score, changed by score timer. A message, such as game over or get ready. A start button to begin the game. The basic node for UI elements is control. To create our UI, we'll use two types of control nodes, label and button. Create the following children, create the following as children of the HUD node. Label named score label. Label named score label. I bet I can do like uh, new is not what I wanted. Command A. Command A for add. Label named message. Uh, add button named start button. And timer named message timer. Except I don't want it to be a child of start button. Click on the score label and type a number into the text field in the inspector. The default font for control nodes is small and doesn't scale well. There is a font file included in the game as it's called Zolonium Regular.ttf. To use this font, do the following. Under theme overrides, arrow fonts. So first, HUD. Click on the score label, type a number, we'll give it zero. Zero is a perfectly good number. The default font for control, to use the font to the following, under theme overrides fonts, click on the empty box and select new dynamic fonts. Theme overrides fonts, font, new dynamic font, dynamic font, Click on the dynamic font you added under font, font data, choose load, and select the Solonium regular TTF. Font data, quick load, font Solonium. Got them. Set the size property under settings. 64 works well. Settings, size, oops. 64. Once you've done this on the score label, you can click the down arrow next to the font property and choose copy, then paste it in the same place in the other two control nodes. Copy. That's, a, that's an improvement over the last tutorial. Message. On the other two control nodes. That's the, the score label, message, theme overrides, fonts, paste. Start button. I guess the start button could also be a control thing. Theme overrides, fonts, oops, fonts, paste. Nice. Note, anchors and margins. Control nodes have a position and size, but they also have anchors and margins. Anchors define the origin, the reference point for the edges of the node. Margins update automatically when you move or resize a control node. They represent the distance from the control node's edges to its anchor. Arrange the nodes as shown below. Click the layout button to set a current to set a control nodes layout. Zero, dodge the creeps, start. I guess message. I missed the part where it told me to set the text of message. Text. Uh, 
Massage the creeps. Align center. Let's. It's really hard to. I like it better without those things. What does this do? Use smart snap. Use grid snap. I like smart snap. Grid snap is annoying because the grid makes everything else too hard to see. Score label. Hey, there we go. What's this thing? Start button. Move that down there. Text, start, align center, good. You can drag the notes to place them manually or more, for more precise placement, use the following settings. Ah, score, layer, score label, layout top wide. Where is... Layout top wide. Uh, I don't see it. Whatever, it's all close enough. Text zero, align center. But where is... Anyway. On the message timer, set the wait time to two and the one shot property to on. Message timer, one shot, two. Now add this script to HUD. Extends canvas layer signal start game. start signal tells the main node that the button has been pressed. Funk show message of text. Dollar sign message dot text. Was text. Message dot show. message timer dot start this function is called when we want to display a message temporarily such as get ready funk show game over show message game over Wait until the message timer has counted down. Yield message timer timeout. Yield dollar sign message timer, not quotes. Message dot text we will dodge the new line creeps. Message.show. Yield get tree create timer one timeout. Create timer one 
I'm gonna put time out. I'm not sure what's happening there. Make a one shot timer, wait for it to finish. Start button dot show. This function is called when the player loses. It will show game over for two seconds. Then return to the title screen and after a brief pause, show the start button. Note, when you need to pause for a brief time, an alternative to using a timer note is to use the scene's create timer function. This can be very useful to add delays such as in the above code where we want to wait some time before showing the start button. GD script. Funk update score of score. Uh, what's wrong here? Semicolon. Okay, I need a semicolon for the function definition. That's fair. And timeout needs to be in quotes. That's all cleaned up now. Funk update score of score. Score label dot text equals string of score. Score label dot text equals string of score. This function is called by main whenever the score changes. Connect the timeout signal of message timer. Mm. This function is called by main whenever the score changes. Connect the timeout signal of message timer and the press signal of start button and add the following code to the new function. So timeout signal of message timer node timeout signal connect and the press signal of start button start button pressed connect those on start button pressed start button dot hide Emit signal start game. Funk on message timer timeout message dot hide. Connecting HUD to main. Looks like we've done all the things we needed to there. Now that we're done creating the HUD scene, go back to main. Instance the HUD scene in main like you did the player scene. The scene tree should look like this, so make sure you didn't miss anything. So in main, we instance HUD. Open. Player, start timer, mod timer. Player, start timer, mod timer. Score timer, start timer, start position. Score timer. Where's start timer? Move that down. Start timer. Position. Mob path. Mob spawn location. HUD. Mob path. Mob spawn location. HUD. Now we need to connect the HUD functionality to our main script. This requires a few additions to the main script. In the node tab, connect the HUD start game signal to the new game function the main node by typing new game in the receiver method on the connect signal window. Connect the HUD start game signal. HUD start game to the new game function of the mode by typing new game in the receiver method. New game in the receiver method. It'll verify that the green connection icon appears next to funk new game in the script. Connect. Yep, the green connection icon. Okay, good. In new game, update the score display and show the get ready message. HUD.update score of score. Score. And HUD.show message get ready.
get ready. In a game over, we need to call the corresponding HUD function. HUD dot show game over. Game over. HUD dot show game over. Finally, add this to the on scene, on score timer timeout to keep the display in sync with the changing scene. HUD dot update score of score on score timer timeout. That update score of score. Is that right? Yep. Now you're ready to play. Click the play the project button. You will be asked to select a main scene, so choose main.tscm. I don't have to. Uh oh, the start button's already there. Game over. Oh, game over. It's really janky, the way that the buttons are. The way that the buttons are, but that's okay. It basically works. Okay, I'll let myself do this. Ah, that's kind of exciting, chasing those things around, or dodging those things around. Uh, let's see about the... If you play until game over... Okay, let me actually make two notes to myself. Hey, Captain Fubar! Captain Fubar says, hey, how's it going? It's going well. I am doing a much better job of getting through this tutorial tonight than when I tried it a few days ago. Although I can show you there's one small error that I'm not sure whether it's my error or an error in the instructions, but take a look. The game starts, but the start button is still there. What if I click it? Things get kind of mixed up, I think. Yeah, that, that the game state needs a little bit of work. But if I let myself lose here, then I can use the start button. I can lose. Okay, Danny McGee. Oh, 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 no, oh, no. Game over. So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna record a clip of that mix-up. That the start button is already there. Okay, Captain Fubar. Um, the other note I was going to make... Oh yeah, you will be asked to select a main scene, so choose main.tscn. I don't think you'll be asked that, because in a previous part of the lesson, it already had you choose that. But hey, Danny McGee and Captain Fubar, thanks for stopping by. How's your night?
removing old creeps. <laughs> if you play until game over and start a new game right away, the creeps from the previous game will still be on screen. It would be better if they all disappeared at the start of a new game. We just need a way to tell all the mobs to remove themselves. We can do this with a group feature. In the mob scene, select the root node and click the node tab next to the inspector. In the mob scene, node groups. Oh, okay. Cool. Danny McGee says, just chillin'. That's good to hear. Next to signals, click groups and you can type a new group name and click add. Group name will be mobs. Add. Oh, also a thing I want to mention is that it's really, or uh, this Godot engine is really ergonomic and keyboard based because you can do things like add timer and then enter and change the name. And then do another, oops, not new. I keep doing that wrong. Um, so yeah, great demo. Mob is the one that I was playing with. I'm going to cut that out. Um, mob group. Let's clip that off. Save that for later for my notes. Okay. Now all mobs will be in the mobs group. We can add the following line to the new game function in main. Get tree dot call group mobs comma q3. The new game function in main. Main. Where's the new game? There it is. Get tree dot call group quote mobs you free is that right yeah the call group function calls the named function on every node in a group in this case we are telling the mob to delete itself the game's mostly done in this point in the next and last part we'll polish it a bit by adding a background looping music and some keyboard shortcuts well the first thing i'm actually going to do is uh, hide the new game button. HUD dot new new game. What's it called? HUD dot start button. Hmm, that's not going to work quite right, I can tell. Invalid get index start button on base canvas layer HUD. What if I get node HUD slash start button? Maybe maybe I need to use that. Okay, now if I run it, does it do the right thing? Yes. And let's just make sure that the start button comes back. There's the start button. And the old creeps disappear. Let's give the creeps a chance to be a bunch of them. Game over. Dodge the creeps. Start. They do disappear, even though they're mostly gone by the time it happens. Oop, game over. Okay. Captain Fubar says the path would be dollar sign HUD slash start button. Oh.
Remember the dollar sign is the equivalent to the get node button. Get node method. So what I was trying to do before was hud dot start timer. Well, actually, now it seems to be working. Oops. It well, the autocomplete was working, which isn't necessarily proof that it's going to work. Dollar sign HUD slash start button. Okay, I just had the syntax missed up on a forward slash. It's what I needed, but a dot is what I was using. So again, I was trying to do dollar sign HUD dot start button. But what I needed to do was dollar sign HUD slash start button. And now it should work. Yep. You know, it'd be nice if... I'm not gonna probably mess with this now, but it'd be nice if... Well, maybe I don't care about that as much as I thought I did. Game over. Captain Poobar says, yes, you can even use dollar sign path slash two slash the slash node. Yeah, that makes sense. Once you... Oh, I was gonna do a clip of that. It's too late now, but... Maybe I'll get some of it. Syntax matters. Okay. I think I can finish this tutorial tonight. Finishing up, we have now completed all the functionality for our game. Below are some remaining steps to add a bit more juice to improve the game experience. Feel free to expand the gameplay with your own ideas. Background. The default gray background is not very appealing, so let's change its color. One way to do this is to use a color rect node. Make it the first node under main so that it will be drawn behind the other nodes. Okay, we got main, we got color rect. Make it the first one so it's drawn behind the other nodes. Color rect has only one property, color. That's very basic, and it's appropriate. Choose a color you like and select Layout Full Rect so that it covers the screen. Where's Layout? So for color, I kind of like the gray. So I might... You see it in the 2D editor. Oh. Center top. Or in your case, the right top. Let me read the... Select layout full rect so it covers the screen. Okay, layout full rect. There we go. Let's give it... Kind of a blue purple color might be nice. Let's give that a try. Well, it's not very pretty, but it's better than the maybe it's better than the gray. Game over. That's okay. You can also add a background image if you want by using a texture rect node instead, that's okay. Sound effects. Sound and music can be the single most effective way to add appeal to the game experience. In your game assets folder, you have two sound files, house in a forest, loop, og, background music, and game over wave for when the player loses. Add two audio stream player nodes as children of main. Main, new, not new. Keep doing that. It's command A for adding. Audio stream player 2D. 
Oh, 3D would be spatial. Captain Fubar says, do you have experience with audio production? A little bit. I have a lot of experience with music and I have a little bit of experience with audio production. Two audio stream player knows it's children of main. Name one of the music and the other death sound. Add audio stream, but make it a child of Play the music, add music.play to the new game function, and music.stop in the game over function. So we have main, script, game over, dollar sign music.stop, and new game music.play. Uh, I got that backwards. Oh no, game over music.stop, new game music.play. Finally, add death sound.play in the game over function. Captain Fubar says if you need a very simple audio wave generator, VFXer can generate all the game sounds you need in a, in a small game. www.bfxer.net. Let me open that up on my PC over here. VFXer is an elaboration of the glorious SFXer, the program of choice for many people looking to make sound effects for their computer games. Cool. I think I'll give that a try in a future stream. Or possibly even. Captain Fubar says, like pickup, jump sounds, etc. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, where was I? Let's stop. Keyboard shortcuts, do I care about that right now? Yeah, let's be completionists. Uh, but what I want to do is... Why was I going to open up this window? Captain Fubar says, very small application. There is even a Godot implementation of BFXer, of which I don't remember the link. Okay. That's cool. I want to hear these sounds that I've added. You know what? I haven't added the sounds yet. Because I need to choose can I quick load house in a forest loop dot og. Death sound quick load. Oops. Um, game over that way is open. Okay, let's try it. I like this. Okay, game over sound now. Oh, can't hear the music anymore. Oh, but then you hear it again when you start. Oh, that's delightful. <laughs> Simple pleasures, right? Oh no, I think I died. Okay. That was fun. Keyboard shortcut. Since the game is played with keyboard controls, it would be convenient if we could also start the game by pressing a key on the keyboard. We can do this with the shortcut property of the button node. In a previous lesson, we created four input actions to move the character. We'll create a similar input action to map the start button. Select Project, Project Settings, and click on the Input Map tab. Project, Project Settings, Input Map, 
action start game, I guess. And I'm going to use the space bar. Hope I did that right. We'll see. In the same way you created the movement input actions, create a new input of start game and add a key mapping for the enter key. Well, I use the space bar key. I think that's going to work well enough. Captain Fubar says, I think this one was even composed by Redoz, Juan Linetsky, one of the founders of Godot. Oh, that's cool. Select project, project settings, and then click on, I did that. In the HUD scene, select the start button and find its shortcut property in the inspector. We can close that, HUD. Find its shortcut property in the inspector. HUD, HUD, not node, inspector, filter properties, hmm, what am I missing? Captain Fubra says, what does the text say again? Yeah, let's refer to the text. In the HUD scene, so select the Start button and find its shortcut property in the inspector. Select New Shortcut. So select the Start... Oh, ah, uh, yes. Select the Start button. That's what I missed. And now Shortcut, Empty. New Shortcut and click on the Shortcut item. A second Shortcut property will appear. Select... New input event action and click the input event action. Finally, in the action property, type the name start game. That's kind of a lot of steps. I think I did that right. Shortcut, 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 event, input, event, action, start, game. Captain Fubar says, seems good. Yep, it seems good when I actually read and pay attention to the instructions. Now when the start button appears, you can either click it or press enter to start the game. Well, it's going to be spacebar for me. And with that, you completed your first 2D game in Godot. And the timer's up, so that's good timing. So let's save, let's run, let's test the functionality of pressing the spacebar to start the game again. Yep, works. Let's see if I can get to 15. Ooh, oh my. Get away from that edge. Ah! Oh, I got to 14. Oh well. It was fun. So it says, you got to make a player-controlled character, enemies that spawn randomly around the game board, count the score, implement a game over, and replay, user interface, sounds, and more. Congratulations. There's still much to learn, but you can take a moment to appreciate what you achieved. And when you're ready, you can move to your first 3D game to learn to create a complete 3D game from scratch in Godot. Well, if I end up doing that, and if this ends up on YouTube, then check up there for the next video, your first 3D game.